Spring is officially here. The sun came out. The rule of six is back. And local elections are coming soon. Yes, so it's not exactly Easter eggs and frolicking lambs, but local elections were cancelled in 2020. And they're back and bigger. Proof perhaps that life is heading slowly back towards a degree of normality. So this week I'm bringing you two people who are both running in May's elections. There's Tory mayoral candidate for the West Midlands, Andy Street, and making her grand return to politics after a mere 24 years out of the political game, former MP Edwina Curry, on why she's running to be a local councillor in Whaley Bridge in Derbyshire. But first up, as far as spin doctors go, my first guest is probably one of the most famous has ever been. He is, after all, the man who many think inspired this iconic TV character. Come on, people, let's get right, go going here. Running. I've got a to-do list here that's longer than a f-ing Leonard Cohen song. That was, of course, Malcolm Tucker from the BBC's The Thick of It. And I am, of course, talking about Alistair Campbell, the former number 10 director of communications under Tony Blair. The eighth volume of his diaries came out this week, cataloguing the five years to 2015 and ending with the re-election of David Cameron. So what does Alistair Campbell make of the state of the Labour Party six busy years later? And what does he think of the party's leader as we approach one year of Keir? And how would he advise him? Working, I've been assured. I'm, uh, um, I'm, I'm so I'm late. Yeah, don't worry, don't worry. I've actually, I've actually, um, I've done my civil partnership today. Oh my goodness, that's a yeah, moment. Yeah. Alistair Hollett thought. Sarah, shut the door. I can't... <laughs> uh, huge apologies there. Right, I'm back with you now. My <laughs> wife's talking on the phone. Listen, why are you allowed to talk on the phone? I know, it's allowed. perfectly right. Especially one of, yeah, a new, newly civil partnership wife in your, in your case, totally. Right, OK. Um, <laughs> Alistair Campbell, welcome to Chopper's Politics. Great to have you on. Thank you. I've been watching The Ever Given recently, sitting there until uh, just uh, last night was released by some tugs from the uh, Egyptian mud. Is that the Labour Party at the moment? <laughs> Uh, no, I don't think so. I think that was a that was a. It's it's really strange to me, you know, how that story is. It's really been projected almost like a bit of a joke, and it's been memes and cartoons yeah. and what have you. But it's actually it's one of the biggest disasters to the world economy that we've had in decades. I know billions lost in trade. Absolutely, yeah. So, look, if you look at where Labour were at the election, and what Keir has done in that time. I'd say he made a good start. But I think that what's happened now is that you've got a government that has, you know, I think, I'm, I'm sure lots of Telegraph readers and listeners won't necessarily agree with this, but I think it's the worst government of my lifetime. I think Johnson is a truly awful prime minister. I think they made a complete hash of COVID. They're making a complete hash of Brexit. And yet they're ahead in the polls. And in our system, that means that either I've completely lost all sense of where the public mind is and where the public mood is, or it means that the Labour Party are really not doing the job that they need to do in terms of breaking through to the public about what it is that they say about themselves and what it is they say about the government. And so that worries me. So if you take the first point there, is it not the case this is a health crisis, not a political one? Your points you know, are points well made, and that may be the case, but the public don't want to hear that yet, and that's backed Keir Starmer into a corner when he's got to support the government on its attempts to tackle this pandemic, and there's no space for him to do his own policies. That is one of the reasons why it's been proving to be very difficult. Look, I completely get why on COVID that he wanted to be in a position of saying that, you know, we broadly support the government in that we want to support the government in trying to get us out of this mess. But I think along the way, if you don't call out in a way I think that should be called out, for example, some of the really dubious, questionable contracts that have been awarded, if you don't, you know, cement in the public mind that right at the start of this, Johnson made a series of terrible decisions with the consequences of which we're still living with. I'm not saying that's all that you do, but I'm simply saying that 
look, the, what's the role, including in a crisis, what's the role of the opposition in Parliament and what's the role of the media? It's to keep the government's feet to the fire because that should improve the performance of government. That's their role. J- just take Johnson. I mean, you know, we're talking here about somebody who, no secret to you, and it won't be any secret to any of you, I don't think, I don't really like or respect him and I don't rate him as a prime minister. But we're talking about somebody who is going to use anything that's thrown his way. Keir has been broadly supportive, okay? When he's totally supportive, Johnson says, thank you very much, yeah, very much, very pleased that you're voting with us. The minute he's stepped out the slightest, Johnson's been sort of whacking him all over the place. You know, he doesn't make his mind up, he's this, is he that, and all the rest of it. And I think that's because he's almost playing fair with somebody who, frankly, to my mind, doesn't deserve to to be played fair with. These are important points to make. And in peacetime, and we're in wartime now, they will be well made and would kind of cut through. But there will be a time for that at at some point in a few years hence, before the next election, when the inquiry starts. Well, listen, I'll I'll, I'll believe an inquiry, a meaningful inquiry, when I see it. Johnson will do move heaven and earth to avoid that. How would you scope this inquiry? I mean, you know, Chilcot went on for years, which you know all about that. But, but you know, this is, this is a year-long crisis. I mean, it'll take a decade to report, won't it? Well, it obviously depends how it's done. But uh, I do think, looking back, I mean, you know, how have we, we... We're one of the biggest economies in the world. We've got one of the most advanced healthcare systems in the world. How on earth have we got to a position where we've got the highest death per capita rates? I mean, that is the, that's got to be the fundamental question. And mm. and it's got to be it's got to be really 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 rigorous. But I don't know is the honest answer. I mean, there are various ways you can do inquiries. My worry is that Johnson will try to do some kind of you know quick lessons learned sort of thing. Probably try and get it to be done by a select committee or an all party parliamentary commission of some sort. But I I really do think that this has got to be judge led. It's got to be witnesses on oath. Uh, and I think I really do think there's a terrible story to be told there. But my point is that I don't agree that, and and by the way, even in wartime, you know, prime ministers did not get a complete free run at everything that they did. Now, I'm not saying Keir's giving Johnson a free run. He's not. He's, he's, you know, he's been good at prime minister's questions. He asks pretty rigorous questions. But we're in a position where Johnson doesn't answer them. And therefore, I think that both parliament and the media have not yet worked out how to hold to account a government, part of whose strategy is not to be held to account. Going back to Keir Starmer, he is taking, I think, from the uh, Tony Blair playbook in the mid-90s when you were at your pomp, doesn't he need a fight with the left to show that he's taken a party back to centre ground? It's not enough to say under new management. This is he needs a fight. and In, in a way, I mean, the, I think the one thing that most members of the public will, will at least be vaguely aware of is that you know, Jeremy Corbyn did get expelled. Uh, that's quite a big, big signal. I mean, look, there are three things you have to do in terms of, you know, getting from opposition to government. You've got to have a very good critique of the government, which resonates with the public. You've got to have a very good critique about yourself and messaging about what it is that you're trying to do as the Labour Party. And then you have to develop policy that come the election, people are aware of it and they're thinking, mm, yeah, that team... And that set of policies, I can see them in power. Now, I think on all three of those things at the moment, I would say, Keir, good start, but an awful long way to go. Now, listen, onto your diary, Alistair Campbell. I've got volume eight in my hand. It's a definite a tome. My initial thought when uh, the producer said to talk to you about your book, I thought, not a, another bloody book about the coalition. But having gone through parts of this, it's a great read. Good. It's a great observation of the coalition time. And, and I say that having... <laughs> Not wanted to say that, but I think it's a, it's a terrific book. You know, you're, you're doing it through someone who's just trying to get Labour going. You're like, almost like like uh, winding the handle on, on Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and the car won't start, <laughs> but you're doing your best through, through the period. You touch on the 2014 indie re- referendum and you mentioned Alex Sander talk. I wonder if he's been in touch with you about Alba. Has that happened yet? Alba. Alba, forgive me, Alba. Yeah. No, he's not. Although I noticed the other day that <laughs> I do these mad Instagram live rambles and I've been doing some live readings on Instagram. And I did one the other day say, and it said, I'm going to read all the Alex Salmon, Nicholas Sturgeon extracts at seven o'clock or whatever it was. And I know 
is the first like <laughs> of, <laughs> of my post came from none other than Alex Salmon Blue Tick. Um, so he's obviously keeping tabs, but yeah. no, he's not been in touch about that. And uh, But it was really, you know, the other thing that's interesting about keeping a diary is I'd forgotten about that conversation that we had. I mean, I remember I went to do an interview with him for GQ and I remember that I'd done that. But it was actually that he asked me to be part of the independence transition team. And then there's another bit towards the end of the book where Jeff Aberdeen, his chief of staff, is sort of sussing me out to find out whether I thought that if the numbers fell in the right way, whether Ed Miliband might think about Alex as a as a deputy prime minister. Gosh. Uh, and the, the Tories, of course, exploited that with that, that image of, of Salmon with a, with a little, little Ed Miliband in the pocket. Absolutely. And you, and you turned down a peerage. I mean, I suppose... What I do in my life is forget about my failures, or, or I probably mope about them and forget about the successes. But in your diary, you can't hide from either. They're there on the page, and you turn down a peerage. I wonder how, how you feel about that, you know, nearly a decade later. Oh, happy. happy. Relief. I mean, I, I would, oh, really? God, I, I, would, I would. Well, one, I would never, I don't think I'd ever have gone in the House of Lords. I just don't see myself as a House of Lords person. And I, 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 the other thing I, I, I was remembering the other day, and again, which I wouldn't have remembered if I hadn't had the diary, was Michael Heseltine saying to me, you would absolutely hate it in here. And and I think I would. I just wouldn't, you know, and it's, I, I just, I wouldn't enjoy the House of Lords. I really wouldn't. So no, I don't feel bad about that at all. And you were urged to be an MP quite a lot, weren't you? Because your your lines were landing in the early, early months of the coalition, but you, you never went down that path, did you? No, and, you know, at one point, both Jonah and I were really seriously thinking about it. But I think that, you know, and I, I feel guilt about this because i still get people labor people and other people saying listen you know politics is in a mess at least you understand it you should get a seat you should go in there you should try and sort things out you know stop just lobbing stones from the sidelines and i get that and i feel you know deep guilt about not doing more but i think that the other thing i think you'll have seen in the in the in this volume and the previous volume seven in particular i'm really really struggling with my mental health and trying to get to a better place and the truth is i have managed to get to a better place and i really i think that if i went back into it full time i I would put that at risk did you do you have dinner with fiona and granita and agree not to stand with her (laughs) that's an old joke for listeners who are who may not remember that joke but never mind yeah (laughs) anybody any you know pensioners may remember (laughs) granita i don't think granita exists anymore does it no it's gone isn't it it's very, very sad part of political history that's gone for those who don't know, that's where Tony Blair and Gordon Brown had a dinner at which it was decided Tony would run. No, we both decided, I decided first that I wouldn't do it. And then Fiona was still on it um, and she was going to go for the seat in that Tulip Sadiq has got, Hampstead and Highgate. And she literally, she woke up in the middle of the night and she sort of nudged me and said, why am I doing this? I said, I don't know, you're, you're <laughs> the one who's deciding whether to do it or not. And she said, no, I really think we're... We're in a better place. I think your next, the next volume nine will be amazing, by the way, when you go through the trauma for you probably of the Brexit referendum and then the attempt to reverse it. Some have told me who experienced uh, the vigour with which you attacked the Brexit result was because you'd been out of politics for six years and you were desperate to get back in and you kind of almost overdid it because some say about Brexit, had you accepted or had Labour accepted the the offer that Theresa May made, it would have been a kind of half-in, half-out result, which would be better than the one we have at the moment for you. Yeah, but I just don't think the Tory party was going to accept that. I think the politics of the Tory party and the, and the Brexit party as well, I don't think that was going to happen. So I see why people say that. And look, I, I, I think the other thing, is, the, there's, there's two things to say about that. I'm going to talk about guilt again. I didn't do that much in the referendum itself. I went back. Craig Oliver asked me to go and help out with the debate preparation, but I didn't really get involved in the campaign. And like everybody, I think, I thought, you know, Cameron seems pretty confident about the way it's going. The polls look reasonably good. And, you know, it was only about a month out that I realised it was, I thought it was going really, really badly wrong, by which time it was probably too late. And then I think that I, 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 I really threw myself into it Maybe when it was too late, it was after the event, it was after the referendum. And that's when I, you know, really did get involved and I got very involved in the People's Vote campaign and so forth. And, um, you know, I, I thought that was a legitimate thing to do. I think to have had a referendum on the specific outcome of the negotiations, I think that was a fair thing to do. But, you know, we lost. And um, we lost pretty badly when it came to it because, of course, Johnson became 
leader of the Tory party, he fought the election on Brexit and he got a reasonable majority. And that's all your fault because you got the uh, 2012 Olympic Games for the UK, which made Boris Johnson. J'accuse at Alistair Campbell. Well, and, you know, you I think that? that, no, not necessarily, but I do, <laughs> I do, look, the book is, as you know, that I do call the book The Rise and Fall of the Olympic Spirit because I think 2012, which is right in the middle of this book, it was, it was one of the best times to be alive. I loved every day of it. I was so glad that we'd gone for it after all the doubts about doing that. Um, and I dedicate the book to Tessa Jowell because I think that, you know, she was a really big persuader in getting Tony Blair to kind of throw everything at it, to get the games. We got the games. The games were fantastic. But I think it's fair to say that, you know, when, in fact, the Telegraph I saw the other day, they, they ran a little piece on the book in, the, in your sports, grassroots sports campaign. The part where I tried to persuade Jeremy Haywood, who I did persuade, and Keith Mills and I persuaded him to try to persuade Cameron that on the back of the Olympics, coming out of it, Olympic legacy in sport should be a cabinet, become a cabinet position, at least for, you know, while the legacy was cemented. And I really do feel we've lost it. And I think that part of what Cameron saw in the Olympics, one, he saw it maybe it was a bit of a new Labour thing, a bit of a hangover. And also the only politician who seemed to get a bounce out of it was, um, was Boris Johnson. It's what made him a global figure. Alistair Campbell, it's been great to have you on. I assume you're, you're, taking, you're just taking an entry of tonight. Hope you give us a good write-up for this podcast. I'll say, got talked into doing this bloody podcast malarkey. <laughs> uh, some bloke called Hope uh, arrived late, had me hanging around for half an hour, managed to do a bit of paperwork and look at some of the tweets about the civil partnership. Couldn't believe how rude he was to his wife when all she was doing was making a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. I'm not, sure I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not going to buy volume 12 now, <laughs> given that. Um, Alistair Campbell, it's been great to have you on. Will you come on again? Yeah, of course I will. Really good. All the best. And good luck with the book. It sounds, it's, it's a great read. Well, listen, yeah, I'm sure that when the, when the publisher hears it, they'll be putting your quotes on the paperback back cover. <laughs> <laughs> Alistair Campbell, thank you for joining us this week on Chopper's Politics. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Now, do stay with us. In just one moment, I'll be talking to Andy Street, Tory mayoral candidate for the West Midlands and former businessman, right after this. We're interrupting this podcast to bring you news of another Telegraph show we think you might like. It's called Planet Normal, and it's hosted by me, Liam Halligan. And me, Alison Pearson. We're both Telegraph columnists who share the view that far too often those who shout the loudest on the telly just don't represent the views of normal people. So take a trip with us to Planet Normal. We're joined by some stellar guests, well-known voices from politics, business and the arts. All from different fields, but they have one thing in common. They're at the top of their game, but distinctly down to earth. The good news is I finally learned what a podcast is and even how you subscribe to it. It's actually quite simple. Search for Planet Normal on your podcast app or click on the link in the show notes for this episode. You don't really know what a podcast is, do you? I am one. Look, I am one. Who needs to know what it is? I am one. Okay, shut up. (laughs) And we're back. My next guest is Andy Street. The former managing director of John Lewis has been the Tory mayor of the West Midlands for the past four years, and now he's running again. Now, these metropolitan mayors came with their own during lockdown last year, when local areas were able to try to negotiate their own local support packages. So I gave Andy Street a ring, and I started by asking him how he found being back on the campaign trail. Well, we, we think it's going well, but we genuinely don't know. It's rather strange, Chris, because obviously in these COVID times, we're not doing knocking on doors, haven't been. So you just don't have the normal points of reference. All our hustings are online with a virtual audience. So it's very, very difficult to know the reaction that you're getting. You will know, Chris, that this uh, part of the country is incredibly finely balanced. Last time I won by just 4,000 in 2 million votes. That's 150 per constituency. So very, very tight. So we can't, we genuinely do not know which way it's going to go. It's going to be neck and neck. But our volunteers are out there. They're telling the story and they're giving me very encouraging feedback, actually, that they don't see any fundamental change from where we were at the last general election, for example. 
Are you better known now as the mayor or that bloke from John Lewis? <laughs> Good question. Uh, so I think I'll always be that bloke from John Lewis, won't I? But uh, four years ago when I stood, I was only that bloke from John Lewis because I'd never stood in a political election before. Yeah. And that seems quite strange that I stood, stood into something of this profile. But now, as I say, I'll always be the bloke from John Lewis, but I hope I'm also the chap who's delivered for the West Midlands over the last four years. And the, the evidence is yes, people understand that. Well, on that very point, is that right or are you too knowingly undersold? So if that's a question about style, uh, I It is a bit where... because I'm, I look at, say, the Metro Mayor in, in Manchester, Andy Burnham, I mean, he, he had these punch-ups, didn't he, about money, and he became quite recognised and he became quite a figure. And you're much more understated, aren't you, in Birmingham? Well, let's be clear. In the West Midlands, please, Chris, don't upset the Forgive me. Yeah, OK. But that's just a question of how one goes about it and what you've actually got to examine and what are the results, not what are you actually, what noise are you making? And my whole approach right from the beginning has been to work with government to get investment into the West Midlands. And if we look at some of the really big things that we've achieved, like our housing deal, which led to all our investment here, that I literally had to go and sit in Philip Hammond's office and say, I'm not going until this is agreed. So you can be extremely robust in arguing for your region without resorting to the steps that others do, which, of course, were standing on the steps of the town hall and having the public debate and stand up government. And I do not believe, and this is what I learned in business, you do not achieve anything in a negotiation getting to an agreement if you literally have that standoff approach. So I've tried to engage with people to get an outcome. And you think those deliverables are, are real, do you? I mean, some critics say they aren't. They say things like there's, you know, police numbers have fallen since 2010, 20% down. They say things like that the, the West Midlands councils have 33,000 uh, 18 to 24-year-olds on un- unemployment benefit. Do you think people are benefiting from having a, having a Conservative mayor enough? So I'm absolutely sure the things I've been directly responsible for, the evidence of progress is there on the ground. So yeah. let's just take perhaps the thing that mayors are most famous for it was the thing that Ken Livingstone was most famous for when he set up the London mayoralty was transport. And if you look at what's happened there, we have actually seen a sevenfold increase in our investment in transport. And every penny of that has had to be lobbied and won through. So there is absolutely no question that our approach of winning investment from government has definitely delivered on the ground. You are right, though, Chris. Let's not let's not be naive about this that after the pandemic, this region has been very badly affected economically. So actually, the question at this election is who do you most trust to rebuild the West Midlands economy, given what's happened? I don't actually think that anybody would hold me personally responsible for what's happened during the pandemic. But I do think they would judge who is capable of delivering the recovery from that. You didn't mention HS2 there as one of your big things, but you that you were one of the main champions of driving that forward, weren't you? Yes, I was. And I know some disagree with me, but I think if you think of what the job of the mayor is, it is to step forward and lobby for what you really believe in. And I still believe that will be a huge beneficial investment for the West Midlands. So, yeah, um, when lots of members of the government weren't really clear what their view was, or perhaps they were waiting to see which way the prime minister wanted to go. I was very clear. I've got to get out there and do the lobbying. Some journalists even say that I persuaded the Prime Minister. I think that's probably overblowing it. But <laughs> uh, I was very willing to stand up and be counted because you should do that in this job. Even though we are seeing a decline in, in travel numbers uh, and people are saying 20% down uh, in, the, in the foreseeable future because of COVID, do you think the numbers still stack up for HS2? Yes, we're not judging HS2 on the back of the COVID situation. This is an investment that you know everyone said was for 50 or 100 years' time. If you look at any modern industrialised country in the world, it has a first-class public transport system anywhere. The Japanese, the Germans, any leading country. And I am utterly convinced that we had to take the next investment stage because our West Coast mainline was full, was frankly over-invested, was 100 years old. This will give us the spine of new transport for the next 100 years. And therefore, it it shouldn't be reviewed post-COVID. I'm not expecting it to be reviewed. I think the government has made its decision. And if you look at the diggers in the ground along the, certainly the London-Birmingham route, it's very clear they're pressing ahead. Do you think Birmingham can be a kind of commuter town to London eventually? It doesn't want to be a commuter town to London, so I'm sure... Is that a classic Westminster question, isn't it? It is, it is. Yeah, you're looking at it from the wrong end of the line. But there's an interesting stat here. There's an interesting stat because, and this will surprise you, pre-COVID, there were actually lots of young Londoners moving to the West Midlands, far more moving here than other parts of the country. 
And Birmingham, for the first time in decades, actually had a positive net brain drain with London. So that tells you what's happening. We don't need to be a commuter town for London, thank you very much, or a commuter city for London. We need to be the centre of our own economic region. And obviously, HS2 connects us to elsewhere. I'm going to ap- apologise now to the entire region for even suggesting anything but... One big thing that you that you can talk about is building new homes. Yes. Uh, are you concerned about the green belt around Birmingham? Uh, concerned about the green belt around the whole conurbation, actually, and actually more of it is around places other than Birmingham, actually. So all of the west of the Black Country, if you think into Staffordshire, and then of course around the north of Sutton Coalfield, and all around Coventry, Solihull, and then yes, the south of Birmingham. Uh, but the the most important thing about this is that we are building the homes we need and protecting the green belt. I have no time for people who deny all form of development at all, because we have got to develop the homes that our young people need. We talked about young people aspiring to have great careers and lives in the West Midlands. They need affordable homes. And we've actually doubled the number of homes being built here over the last five years on target for our national projected need. But we've done it nearly all on brownfield land. And why is that? I mean, two simple reasons. Number one, it's got to be right for the climate change reasons and all the things about nature conservancy. But the second reason it's right, and this is the special thing about the West Midlands, every time a home is built on the Greenbelt, in a sense, it's not being built in a derelict industrial place. And if you can force that building on the derelict industrial place, you bring those communities back to life. And that is literally what we are doing. Sites that have been derelict for 30 years are now coming back. I'll tell you the story of one that I'm so proud of as a Brummie. Please do. Longbridge. You will know that Longbridge is etched into industrial history. That yeah. site closed for MG Rover in 2005, 16 years ago. And there's been some development there in the town centre of Longbridge, as it's called. But the West Works, a huge site, was just lain derelict for 16 years in the city, in the second city of this country. And what we've just been able to do is secure the funding, the deal with St Modwin's, turn the first piece of ground to bring back, we're estimating 5,000 jobs in commercial development there. Now, that would not have happened without our brownfield funding approach. And of course, coming back to being tough with government, we got that cash from central government, about 450 million that I negotiated. And that's why Longbridge has now got a digger in the ground. Do you think Metro mayors like yourself are at the heart of what the government calls levelling up? There's a lot of misconceptions about what levelling up is. People think a bypass here, a bridge there is what it's about. It's not. What it really, that's helpful. Not not saying that hasn't got it wrong. What it's really about is this whole question of social mobility, aspirations, opportunities. How do people in some of the towns that maybe been described that famous word left behind, how do they get the right skills, the right job opportunities for the future? And the job of the mayor is to think about that economic plan for his or her region to develop those opportunities. So, yeah, I think having someone at the centre of thinking is essential for the levelling up to really succeed. What's next for Andy Street if you can't get those 4,000 votes this time and can't win this win this uh, election on May the 6th? A run for Parliament? Uh, Chris, I never think about what some call Plan B. I always say, and I said this four years ago, you know, this is a traditional Labour heartland. People gave me no chance. I said there is only Plan A. And my answer to you is the same today. It's only Plan A. The truthful answer... <laughs> is if on the 8th of May the votes don't come out the ballot box in the way in which I want, I shall go to my place in Wales and have a summer as a beach bum in Wales, I think, where all of us just go on holiday. Are you glad you don't work for John Lewis anymore? By that I mean, by the way, a difficult job. I mean, it's such a difficult job in retail right now. Yeah, uh, I understand why you asked the question. And some people say to me, Andy, you had good chose good timing in 2016 to leave. And of course I get that. But I'm glad I'm doing this rather than John Lewis because I made my choice and I stick by it. But actually there's another part of me which says, uh, it's a real conundrum, retail now. And just as it was in 08, of course, when the financial crash came. And I would still, in a sense, love to be part of it because I still believe that John Lewis is a unique brand in the UK, owned by its partners, gives that advantage. Yeah. And I would love to still be steering that. But I made my choice. I walked away. Other people are doing it now. And that's it. Can you settle the final question for, for our listeners? We know where the arches is made. We know that. That's obviously in boom. Yeah. But I'm always confused by the accents on the arches. Now, do you think the Midlands is in the north or the south? Neither. Neither. The truth is... That's a cop-out answer. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's the right answer. Because if you ask a Londoner, they will say that uh, Coventry is in the north. 
If you ask a Mancunian, he will say Wolverhampton is in the south. And there you have the, there you have the, <laughs> and the truth is we're on our own. We're in Mercia is what you probably have called it. Of course you have, yes. Uh, and of course, what we've got to do is build that identity more, but we're not either the north or the south. Well, Andy Street, uh, well, you know, best luck in the elections uh, on May the 6th. And uh, maybe we might see you uh, on the podcast after that. But thank you for joining us this week on Chopper's Politics. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Chris. Great to be with you. Now, 24 years ago, I had just got married to my wife, Sarah. I was working on a trade magazine called Print Week, and I was a big Oasis fan, listening to their albums on my CD Walkman. Yep, a different time altogether. And for my next guest, it was. 24 years ago, Edwina Curry was just closing the door on her time as a Tory MP. But this time, she's back into the world of politics. The former South Derbyshire MP and Junior Health Minister is running to be a local councillor in Whaley Bridge in the upcoming May elections. I wouldn't say it was an obvious choice of hobby in your 70s, so I sat down with Edwina Curry to ask her why she made the decision to get stuck back into politics right now. Well, there's several reasons. I remarried. I I love marriage so much, I've done it twice, Chris. Mm -hmm. And I married a a senior retired officer of a Metropolitan Police who was a real character called John Jones. I'm Mrs. Jones in real life. And we had a wonderful, wonderful time being completely irresponsible, having given, shall we say, a life of service, the pair of us. So off we went on our cruises and all that kind of thing. And then John had cancer and uh, we nursed him through three different cancers over the last nine years. Thank you to the Christie but this time last year, he was told he got some more and um, we lost him in November. Oh. And as anybody will know, whether you've lost somebody from COVID or from cancer, whatever it is, they leave a hell of a hole, a mm. hell of a hole. And I'd been asked already if I would stand for the council. And I said, no, I really don't want to take on that kind of responsibility, you know, or faffing about with probate, that kind of thing. And then they called me just before the inauguration in America, which I was watching. And I looked at Biden and I thought, do you know what? You and I both face great tragedy because he lost his son to a brain tumour and that's what John had. And you came out of it to fight an incumbent who everybody thought was going to win. And the incumbent here in Whaley Bridge is also somebody who people were kind of reluctant to take on, let's put it like that, former member of parliament. And I thought, I can do this. I can do this. And Biden's older than me. And actually, Trump's older than me. (laughs) So if they can do it, what am I complaining? Am I going to spend the rest of my life, another 20 years, watching Netflix? I don't think so. So I said, yes. And then I had to go through an approvals (laughs) process, would you believe? (laughs) Wow. Everybody, including sitting councillors, has to go through a series of questions. And there's a little secret ballot. Yes. And this includes uh, questions like, um, can you cope with social media? So I said, (laughs) I've got 23,000 followers on Twitter. Will that do? Yes, that's okay. And um, can you give any examples of campaigns you have been in um, (laughs) that, that you won? So I thought of a couple and I thought about the gay rights campaign of 1994, Mm. which I wanted to have as all party, Chris. It was no point being just one party. And I said, I want, I'll propose it. I want Neil Kinnock to second it. And all the Labour people said he won't. I said, why won't he? Well, because he's from South Wales and he's got sons and it's about homosexuality. I said, right, I'll take him out to tea. And I did. I took him to the St. Ermans Hotel, which you'll be familiar with. Yep. And I fed him rock cakes and I lectured Neil Kinnock on equality. <laughs> and he caved in and he did it. And he did a very, very good job. He was he was super. I have uh, nothing but good stuff to say about Neil Kinnock. And so then I said, um, you know, will that do to the approvals <laughs> committee? And the chairman, bless him, said, well, we could interview a thousand candidates and I don't think we'd get answers quite as good as that. Yes. <laughs> so they ticked me. I'm in. <laughs> you passed the tick box exercise. How has politics changed, do you think, in the past 30 years? I mean, I'm gonna, you're going to say one word, the internet, I'm sure. But how, how do you think? Well, the internet makes things harder and easier. 
it's easier in that, you know, I don't have to go into the House of Commons library and ask a brilliant researcher who's been there donkey's years to mug up for me a, a particular issue or find some addresses or whatever. Just click online and I can do it in a few minutes. That's brilliant. That's great. It's a danger, of course, because if you put stuff out there, once it's out there, it's out there forever. Even if you delete it afterwards, uh, you've got some explaining to do. And that's also true for your critics. So, you know, it's, it's a double-edged sword. Like any other medium, it's how you use it that really matters. One of the things that people sort of warn me about was, oh, these days everything's a lot nastier. I can tell you in the 1980s it got pretty nasty at times. So that doesn't bother me. And I've just taken the view that I'm going to be as positive and as normal and as <laughs> nice as possible. What are you running on? What are the issues in, in Whaley Bridge which you're hoping to win support from from voters? Well, Whaley attracted a lot of international attention, as you recall, getting on for nearly two years ago in the summer of 2019, when the dam that holds up one of the biggest reservoirs in the country was breached during a prolonged spell of extremely bad weather. And we've just heard that something like £16 million, is some enormous sum of money, is going to be spent now restoring the dam, uh, creating better safety features, uh, restoring the park uh, underneath it, uh, and then filling it up and restoring the sailing club, which I think is what a lot of the locals are waiting for. Um, and that's all going to take till 2024. There's a lot of awareness here of national issues the vaccination program has been taken up extremely well. Very high take-ups here. Everybody's itching. You you know what the side effects of being vaccinated are? Don't you? Smugness and itchy feet. <laughs> <laughs> and if, in fact, we we I think we're absolutely on the ball with the way that the prime minister has presented it. That you know things are slowly opening up, but we're being cautious. And what's really good bearing in mind that the high peak is a high percentage of elderly people, uh, is that we have falling numbers being admitted to hospital and falling number of deaths. So that's the background. That's the background. Do you feel for Matt Hancock? You're a former health minister and, and you were, you know, the, the, the salmonella egg scandal was a big thing which defined your time as health minister. Do you feel, for, it's very hard, isn't it, when, you, when you're trying to deal with, you're trying to pull the levers in wide will make it work for you? He's got the backing of the prime minister, which is great dare I say it, 30 odd years on, which is more than I had, even though as a scientist, she must have known that I was batting on the right side, as it were. And that certainly was proven in inquiries and in all the rest of it since. And I work very closely these days with the egg industry. We keep in touch. They have presented me with an egg cup. I told them I wouldn't take any money from them for saying nice <laughs> things about them. And um, so I have an egg cup. But yes, I feel for Matt and for all the teams, for Chris Whitty, you know, and for Patrick Valance and all those who are really, you're working with out of date info, trying to predict the future. And there's always somebody who knows better than you do. I, I'm an economist by training. If you put 100 economists in a room, Chris, you will get 1000 opinions. And amongst those is going to be one or two that turn out to be right. And science is exactly the same. So, you know, you've, you've got to feel for the ministers. And my impression up north here, ordinary working people, what we used to call the working class, they understand what Boris is doing and why he does it far better than the intellectuals in North London or in the universities. They cut him some slack. They know that there's nothing perfect about this. Have you had any feedback from the PM? The PM was last seen in Whaley Bridge mopping badly, wasn't he? We remember that he came on the day of the breach of the dam. He came immediately. And he walked across that dam when it was a bloody dangerous thing to do. And perhaps, mm. you know, if I'd been one of his advisors, I'd have said, mm, get a bit higher up Whaley Lane if I were you, Prime Minister. <laughs> well, you've only just become Prime Minister. We don't want to lose you just yet. But he came right away and it took Jeremy Corbyn five days until it had been declared safe. And there are long memories in areas like this. People don't forget that. They don't take kindly to being treated as political footballs. Do you see what I'm getting at? That yes. If you are genuinely concerned about the welfare of the people, genuinely concerned to be there when there is a big issue and then promising, don't worry, everything will be done. One of the things that happened was that Derbyshire County Council immediately handed out, I think it was £300 cash to all businesses that had had to be closed in the town. 
And that became a model for what happened during COVID. Yes. And so, you know, we can be quite we're quietly proud. Nobody goes around boasting around here. You get cut Nothing down to say, oh, no, it's Derbyshire. We don't do that. <laughs> Edwina Curry, of course, the Tory party has changed quite a lot since you, you were active in politics. Are you content with some of the direction it's taking in spending and taxation? <laughs> well, I've always been a fiscal conservative and socially liberal. I worry about it. I can see the two great reasons the Chancellor's done it. The first is it's needed to stop the economy collapsing. And I think it's really... It's worked. It's been great to see the money that's gone into retail, to businesses and to culture. Obviously, fabulous. So he's had very strong, positive reasons for doing it. And the other reason, of course, is at the moment, borrowing costs are almost silch. We're almost paying yes. people to take but our money. But that may not last forever. Well, that's the yes, but you say that, Chris, but economists have been saying that for 10 years. And yet borrowing costs have remained extremely low. And as the economy recovers, possibly faster than some countries because of the vaccination programme, then I think we will find that money comes flooding in rather than leaving the country. That sounds like a caveated welcome. I can live with it for the time being, not forever. <laughs> What's next for you then, Edwina Curry? Back in Parliament, it's been done before? It has, and I always think, I, go, I think back to when I was first trying to get a seat in 1981, 82, and all we could see, if I made lists of, of seats, was elderly fat gentlemen sitting on these plum seats, you know, mm. with us young Turks, our Thatcherite enthusiasts, just wishing that they would see the light and retire. They were called bed blockers in those days, weren't they? <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but I'm that kind of age now. I don't think it would be right for me to go back into Parliament. What I can do, though, and again, it's one of the reasons it attracts me to uh, getting involved, I have some unique expertise on health and I chaired a health authority in Birmingham and I was on the council there. I chaired social services. I've done a bit and I was a carer for John for a while, a long time when we were caring for him uh, and we were able to look after him uh, at home. He died at home. And we've had an announcement that it's going to be a white paper on joined up care between the health service, between the social care, the, the nursing and all the rest of it. To me, that's great, but it's going to need some quite thoughtful approaches. I'd like to be involved in that. I've said, I've said to the leader of the council, I do not want to run anything. I'm, I'm allergic to committee meetings. But social care, that's your bag. But I think we might set up some kind of working party, which could then contribute to the national debate. That would suit me fine. Well, when you're a councillor, Edwin and Curry, when you have those ideas about social care, which we'll be seeing later this year from national government, why don't I come back on and tell us about them? I'd love to, if I may, Chris, and we can have proper debate about these. You know, as, as people get older, as our population gets older, we have to grasp this. It can't all be done with employees. There aren't that many. We've got to think about the carers, think about the volunteers, think about how we use the resources that we've got. Edwina Carey, the candidate for the Conservative Party in Whaley Bridge in Derbyshire in the May 6th local elections. Thank you for joining us this week on Chopper's Politics. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, that's all for this week. Thank you to my guests, Andy Street, Alistair Campbell and Edwina Curry. Thank you to my producers, Louisa Wells, Elliot Lampitt and Theo Luludis. But most importantly of all, thank you to you for listening. I always love to hear about what you think of this show. Please share your thoughts by emailing us, chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk or find us on Twitter, we're at chopperspodcast. There are a few other ways you can give us your feedback, though. All positive, I hope. You can leave a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts, just like South Leglander did this week. They said, I enjoy Chris's approach to the subjects, and he always treats his interviewees with friendliness and courtesy. Well, thank you, South Leglander. Reviews like yours really make it easier for me to do my job and help other people find this podcast. And we will always be positive and polite and friendly to all of our guests. Thank you. Plus, we're trying to learn even more about what you like from our podcasts and how we can improve them. So if you can spare five minutes, please fill out our survey. The link is in the show notes. And by taking part, you can win one of three £100 John Lewis vouchers. I'm sure Andy Street would approve. And finally, podcasts like this one wouldn't be made without our fabulous Telegraph subscribers. 
If you're not one already, please go to telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper and get your first month's subscription completely free of charge. And of course, if you can, please buy a copy of the Daily Telegraph. Until next time, though, cheerio!